Philippians 3, verse 1 to 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcised, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. <coughs> But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for, though, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Good morning. Back this week and see everybody. It's good to see a full house as well this morning. Always a nice thing to see. Before we start, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your name. In these uncertain times, we give you glory that you are Lord, not just through the storm, but over the storm itself. We thank you that you have counted us worthy to participate in your glory and we pray that our hearts and minds would be open today as we seek to listen to your word may what you would have spoken be raised up lord and implanted on our hearts and minds we pray these things in jesus name amen i was reading an article during the week and maybe some of you saw it as well the article gave the results of some research that had been carried out in america about what people think about Jesus and who he is and all that kind of thing. And the results were absolutely stunning because the results showed that 30% of evangelical Americans, so people who identify as Christians, people who believe the Bible, the person of Jesus, the gospel, all that kind of thing, three out of 10 American evangelicals believe that Jesus was a great teacher but he wasn't God. Isn't that incredible? You a Christian? Of course. You read the Bible? Absolutely. So you believe the gospel? Yeah, completely. So Jesus is God? Oh no, absolutely not. And it's not just a few people. 30% of American evangelicals is 30 million people who call themselves Christians, call themselves evangelicals, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not Mormons, there are 30 million people in America who call themselves Christians but who believe the same thing about Jesus as Muslims do. Let that sink in for a second. Jesus was a great teacher, but he's not God. So there's a problem here. If you say you're a Christian, that you're saved, that you're going to be with God, when you die, but you don't believe Jesus is God, then you're trusting in something other than Jesus to get you there. You're confident in something you've done or are doing rather than something Christ has done. And Paul in our text today touches on this subject. I think if he was reading on the internet this article like I was and he was commenting, he would have just copied and pasted Philippians 3 and said, well, this is your answer. 
And this sermon is called Confidence in Christ. And we're going to see that Paul gives us a contrast of two different things. If you're taking notes, great. Otherwise, just feel free to listen and you can rewatch later. The first thing is verses 2 to 6. Paul talks about false assurance. False assurance. And in verses 7 to 11, Paul talks about true gain. So false assurance and true gain. But first, let's look at verse 1, just a bit of an intro. Paul says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Anytime you read Paul, this is a feature of how Paul writes. He makes an opening statement which says, basically, this is what I'm going to tell you. And in this instance, the opening statement is, rejoice in the Lord. Now, we all know what rejoice means. In basic English, to be very happy, to be very glad, to be joyful. We rejoiced when baby Amela and baby Ethan came along. We rejoiced when we were able to meet up with friends and family again in June after a period of being isolated. We did not rejoice yesterday when Munster lost to Leinster and set rugby back about 40 years, but that's another story. So we all know what that means. And there are seven instructions in Philippians to rejoice. Not just with babies, not just our social lives, not just sports, but far greater than any of those things, rejoice in the Lord. Be glad in Him. Be happy in Him. Be satisfied and sufficient and content in him. Acknowledge that he has everything that we need. And this, not just for an abstract reason, like some kind of philosophical reason, but for very practical ones. And we'll see that as we go through. Paul says it's no trouble for him to write the same things again to the Philippians. In other words, he's not bothered about repeating himself. He's already said this to them, but he says, this is important, and I'm not bothered about saying it again. And there's something we can learn here about how we can evaluate preaching, or teaching, or pretty much anything to do with the church, with building up God's people. Last week, Seth was talking to us about role models, models for Christian living, of gospel living, about how Timothy and Epaphroditus were so consumed with Christ being everything, that that's how they live their lives, in total service for Christ, not concerned with coming up with creative ways to be clever about communicating, but simply living as Christ would have them live. I watched a video of a pastor in America flying down a zip line from the balcony to the pulpit with the Mission Impossible theme song playing in the background, like it's a big joke, like it's just a bit of a, a, bit of a laugh, something light-hearted, something whimsical. And Paul says this is anything but a joke. Paul says he's not interested in being clever or creative, he's not bothered about repeating himself, writing the same thing again and again, because for them, look at what it says, it's a safeguard. It's a safeguard. The Greek word is aspheles. It means to not fall, to not trip, to not stumble or fall away. Paul knows, in other words, that writing the same thing to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord, will keep them from stumbling, will keep them from falling away. And it's the same thing that he tells you and me in Middleton in 2020. That's his opening statement. Rejoice in the Lord, it will keep you from falling away. And it brings us to the first thing he says, false assurance. Look at verses 2 and 3. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Don't dissociate this from verse 1. This is the same point. This is why he says, rejoice in the Lord. It's why he says, I'm not bothered about repeating what I've already told you. 
because it'll keep you from falling away. Because there are people in the church in Philippi and all around the Mediterranean in churches who have been going around telling Christians that you're not really a Christian unless you also keep the Old Testament law, starting with circumcision. And this was the great tension in the early church because, of course, where did the church start? Who were the first believers? The first believers were Jews. That's why Paul's first stop in a city was always to go into the synagogue because he understood, as he says in other places, he was under obligation to bring this good news to his fellow Jewish people, his kinsmen, saying, he's your Messiah. He's the son of David. He's the child of Abraham, the seed of Eve who would crush the head of the serpent. And we know, joyfully, that many Jews believed, and they still do today. But many didn't. Or they said they did, but they brought all this other stuff along with them. Keep all the dietary laws. Keep all the Sabbath laws. Have your son circumcised. If you don't, you're not saved. And Paul doesn't mince words, does he? Look at what he calls them. Dogs. Now, he's not talking about your labradoodle. Get that in your head. Dogs, in Paul's day, were not cuddly, domestic house pets. They were wild, feral scavengers. And the Jews saw them as being unclean animals. They were unclean. And they often referred to the Gentiles, that's you and me, by the way, they often referred to the Gentiles as dogs, as being unclean. He calls these people evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. He says, you're not adding anything of any spiritual value. All you're doing is mutilating yourself, disfiguring yourself. Paul turns it on his head and says to those people who add additional things to the gospel, you're the dogs. You're the unclean ones. You're the ones who do evil in the eyes of God. And believe it or not, this is not the harshest thing Paul has ever said on this subject. If you read Galatians one, sometime, one of his earliest letters, he said on the same subject, if anyone comes to you, whether it's a man or whether it's an angel, if they come to you and they present the gospel to you in such a way that it's anything other than grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Paul says, let them be damned, cursed, cut off from God. You see what he did there, by the way, cut off from God? I didn't write it, Paul did. And here, in verses 4 to 6, he says, you think you can boast? Here's my CV. Circumcised on the eighth day, in accordance with the law, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. If anyone had any right to put any weight on actions or achievements and count them as putting them in right standing with God, it was Paul. But he says, no, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh, the people who say faith in Christ is not enough to save you. Now, many of you are like me. I grew up in a tradition that said faith isn't enough. Instead, specific acts are required to be saved, starting with baptism. You can't be saved if you're not baptized, the understanding is. Or once you're baptized, you only receive grace from Christ's sacrifice by taking communion. And only if you've confessed your sins to another fallen man before you take communion. It's the same thing, isn't it? It's taking something other than faith, other than grace, putting it on top of the gospel, 
and saying, you must do these things or you're not saved. Putting your confidence, your assurance on these things that are acts on your part and thinking that they guarantee that you get to be with God. Now, that's nobody in this room, presumably. I don't think anybody in this room explicitly thinks or says any of these things. And to be honest, you won't generally find too many people who will explicitly say that in Christian circles these days. They're still out there, but they're not as plentiful as they used to be. But what you're very likely to hear is this attitude that says, all of these things might not be marks of your salvation, they might not guarantee your salvation, but they indicate different levels or classes of Christian. You know what I mean? That you can be a Christian, you and me, we're both believers, but you know, I'm a little higher up on the ladder than you are. I'm a bit more saved than you are. And people can say or think things like this. Well, I read my Bible more often than they do. I know better because I went to Bible college. He only went to Bible college, I went to seminary. I've been a believer far longer than they have. I'm a Baptist of Baptists. I voted for the right candidate, or the right party, because real Christians vote for a certain party, or a certain candidate. I'm a third generation Christian. My parents and grandparents were all preachers. All my children are believers. Well, he might know his Bible, but I'm spirit-filled. That last one, by the way, if you think that there are different categories of Christians based on some have the spirit and some don't, you're in trouble. Because the Bible says you're only saved if you have the spirit. And if you're saved, the spirit dwells in you. Don't let your theology get in the way of what the Bible actually teaches. Anyway, enough said about that. Now, people are at different walks or parts of their walk and their journey. People grow and develop in maturity in different ways, and they go through different seasons. So you can feel strong faith in a season, and you can feel doubt and nervousness in a season. But nobody is any more a believer, any more saved than any other believer. Nobody's a level one Christian, somebody else being a level two Christian, like Scientology, where you start working your way up the pyramid and eventually, when you buy enough books and pay enough money, you get to the top. All of these things, if you're putting any weight on them, they're just going to give you false assurance. Now, we might not explicitly be trusting in them to get them our ticket to heaven, but maybe we think they add something to our walk. Maybe we think that they separate us from other people in this church. And what's more, if that's me, maybe I'm emphasizing those things because there's another area of my life that isn't as strong. Maybe things aren't as rosy where the foundation isn't sound, where maybe I'm like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Build your house on the rock, the one who demolished the dividing wall of partition, the one whose dying words, it is finished, brought the curtain down, no pun intended, I promise, and sealed those who believe with the promise of eternal life. These are the ones Paul says are the truly circumcised. There is no longer Greek or Jew. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus. Don't put your confidence, your assurance in anything else. Instead, look at the last point, true gain, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, 
but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. If he was measuring himself by his old life, Paul was top of the heap, king of the hill, far more spiritual than any of us here in this room. He was the most Jewish, the most Hebrew, the most religious. And yet he says all these things aren't gain. They're not profit. Those things he now counts as loss. These are actual accounting terms. All the things that Paul says were profitable before, now he doesn't see them that way anymore. Illustrated like this, suppose tomorrow I go out and start a business. I leave my public sector job and pension, so clearly I've gone insane and I just want to go do something else. And that business is manufacturing and selling inflatable furniture. Some of you are thinking, ooh, inflatable furniture, that's a good idea. A whole range of them. Armchairs, couches, kitchen countertops, and dining tables. Some of you are seeing the obvious problem here with inflatable furniture. The first time you sit on one of those armchairs with your hot coffee, or you carve the roast on the countertop, pop. Nobody is going to buy this product. Some of you are thinking, oh no, I'd buy it, so thanks for giving me false hope, but nobody's going to buy it. You know it. I know it. And I've got the market research to prove nobody's going to buy it. Now suppose I ignore all that, and I just plow straight ahead anyway. So I'm manufacturing the product, I'm advertising, I'm spending all the money that needs to be spent, and absolutely nobody is buying this. I'm sinking all my money into this. Seneca indicates I've moved back to the States at this point, presumably because I've gone insane, because I'm convinced that I've got something that's profitable. Something that gives me confidence that I'm going to get a return on my investment. Foolish, isn't it? You see, no matter how convinced I am that everything I have and everything I've done and everything I am is going to result in a profit, it's all a loss. Paul says the same thing. He's actually now counted these things as loss, as unprofitable for the sake of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. They don't add anything to his goal. Friend, it honestly doesn't matter if your parents and grandparents were Christians, if you were born into a good family, into a good home, a nice stable environment, you've gone to church every day or every Sunday since you were born, you prayed a sinner's prayer at the age of nine, you went to Sunday school, you became a youth leader, you joined the CU in college, led a Bible study, and put a little fish symbol on the back of your car. If you yourself do not know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, all that other stuff, Look at the end of verse 8. Paul calls it rubbish. The actual word is dung. You know what he's saying? He's saying that if he takes all his heritage, all his upbringing, all his pedigree, all his religiosity, and he puts any confidence in it, it's like a toddler holding up their potty and saying, look what I've done. Dung. Rubbish. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says the same thing. All our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. You know what that means? It's a cloth that women use at a certain time every month. That's what he's saying. Zechariah chapter 3, the prophet sees a vision of the high priest Joshua, supposedly the most holy man in the whole country. And he's covered in dirty clothes, being accused by Satan, because he has no righteousness of his own. Our own righteousness, our own accomplishments, they're not gain. They're loss. Rubbish. Paul says, you want true gain? 
You want to really gain something? I count all these things rubbish, dung, in order to gain Christ, verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So, those 30% of American evangelicals who don't think Jesus was God, they think he's just another person, a great teacher, but just another guy, some carpenter living somewhere in Palestine. They miss the biggest point. Sin deserves death. To atone for sin requires death. And no man can do that because sin is so great. The sins of God's people could only be made as white as snow by the offering of a lamb without blemish. The lamb with no sin. Jesus' death, what we call the atonement, is the fixed point on the map. X marks the spot for where true gain can be found. The suffering servant who was despised, rejected, cut off and cursed, upon whose shoulders the full weight of God's fury against sin was placed, who with every last gasp of air was breathing in your punishment for your sins. Our goals and our strategies and our heritage, they add nothing to what the blood of Christ accomplished. And Paul writes elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, you'll know this verse, God made him who knew no sin to become sin, to bear the full fire of sin for us, so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Not by our efforts, not by our pedigree, our background, anything like that. True gain is not status. True gain is not wealth, it's not health, it's not happiness, it's not success. True gain is Christ himself. Verses 10 and 11, that we might know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. True gain is having confidence in Christ and in Christ alone. Because only through Christ and only through faith in him can we stand in front of the Father and be declared righteous. I think I've used this analogy before about three guys who are out hill walking and they come across this big gap. It's about 20 meters long. And being men, they're not rocket scientists, they figure we won't find a way around, we'll just try and jump over the gap. And the first guy runs and jumps and he misses by 10 meters. Second guy runs and jumps and he misses it by 5 meters. The third guy runs and jumps and he's actually clawing at the edge, but he still misses. They all fail, didn't they? Yeah, the second guy did better than the first guy. The third guy did better than the second guy but they all fell. Because nothing is going to bridge that gap. If you just try and try and try and put all your efforts and energies into it, the only thing, friend, that bridges that gap is two planks of wood on which Jesus was crucified. I quoted 2 Corinthians chapter five. Later on today, go read it. It's a great chapter. Paul in it talks about how we who have faith in the sacrifice of Christ have been reconciled to God. You all know what that means, reconciled, brought into right relationship with God. And it's actually another accounting term in Greek. Katalage means to take one thing of a certain value and take another thing of the same value and then swap them over. <laughs> That's what Christ accomplished on the cross. All of your sin and all of your good deeds and all of your righteousness, they're on one side of the ledger. 
Christ is on the other side of the ledger. And it's only by swapping them over, by putting our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, that we truly are reconciled to God. So recognize the true gain that Christ brings. Don't put your trust in all the other stuff, your family history, your lineage, your heritage, how often you go to church, how often you read the Bible, all that other stuff. I've spoken to a lot of people over the last few weeks who've been bereaved, who've lost someone, people in church and just people I know, work or friends or whatever. And the believers always say the same thing. They always say something like, moments like that show you how important it is to know how valuable Christ is. That we have a limited time here on earth and we need to know how much Christ is worth. He's worth everything. Everything else you could possibly imagine. John Piper, the American preacher, wrote a poem a few years ago. It's all about the life of a believer from being born again through marriage and in his job and all of this kind of a thing. This is the final verse. See him nearing death. Listen to his breath. Through the ebbing pain, final whisper, gain. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the confidence that it gives us in the sufficient sacrifice of your Son. Help us to acknowledge, Father, that there is nothing we can do by our own merits to make ourselves good and pleasing in your eyes, but only by trusting in your Son. Help us to acknowledge those areas in our life where maybe we think we have something above others that separates us from others. Be revealing these things to us, Spirit, convicting us of their reality and of the importance of putting them to death. Help us to trust in you and you alone, Lord, to recognize there is no longer Greek or Jew. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. But we are all one in Christ Jesus who put our faith in him and trust in his sacrifice. Help us to recognize what he has done by swapping all of our sin and all of our strategies to combat them with his own righteousness so that if we put our trust in him, we put on his righteousness and we stand faultless before you. Help us to remember the realities of these things as we go out of this place into our homes, our jobs, school, college, wherever we're going. May we be salt and light to bring the good news of your gospel to the world around us. Be with us as we finish our time together in fellowship. May all things be done to your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week. If you'd like to congregate outside, if you want to hang around and chat just so we can start the cleaning process, we hope to get to chat to you. God bless you all.